Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TMA Ask the Expert podcast series. Today's session is entitled, The Role of Pharmaceutical Companies in Drug Development for Rare Neuroimmune Diseases, What the Community Can Do to Help. My name is Roberta Peche, and I'm the Research and Project Manager at the Transverse Myelitis Association. We are a nonprofit focused on support, education, and research of rare neuroimmune diseases. You can learn more about us by going to our website at myelitis.org. Chitra Krishnan, Executive Director of the TMA, will be moderating our podcast today. A few housekeeping pieces before we start. This podcast is being recorded and will be made available on the TMA website at myelitis.org and can be downloaded via iTunes. During the call, if you have any additional questions, please send them to us via our Facebook page at facebook.com slash myelitis. Great. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, we're very excited to be joined by Dr. Benjamin Greenberg and Dr. Doug Kerr as experts on today's podcast. Um, Dr. Greenberg is an associate professor at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, and he directs the PM and NMR Center at the, at, at the medical school. And he is recognized internationally as an expert in rare autoimmune diseases of the central nervous system. He expects his clinical time between seeing both adult and pediatric patients, and his research interests are in both the diagnosis and treatment of transverse myelitis, neuromyelitis optica, MS, encephalitis, and infections of the central nervous system. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg, for joining us. And Dr. Kerr will be joining us in a few minutes. He is the Senior Medical Director of Neurology Research and Development at Biogen IDEC, where he is responsible for late-stage neurodegenerative programs, focusing on the motor neuron diseases, ALS and SMA. Uh, prior to joining Biogen IDEC in 2009, Dr. Kerr served on faculty at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where he specialized in transverse myelitis and MS, as well as SMA and ALS. He started the first transverse myelitis center at Johns Hopkins, which was the only such center at the time, and also founded and directed the Johns Hopkins Project Restore, a multidisciplinary effort which is dedicated to advancement of treatments for autoimmune neurologic disorders. He has worked on stem cells as a therapeutic tool for functional recovery in patients with TM and motor neuron diseases. Uh, Dr. Kerr will be joining us, as I said, in a few minutes. Um, to start us off, you know, I would love to um, turn, ask you a question, Dr. Greenberg. You work closely on a daily basis with our community. How do you think we can influence drug development priorities to focus on symptom management and recovery from TM or NMO or ADEM? How can individuals who are suffering from these diseases, caregivers, play a valuable role in voicing the patient experience and at the same time be involved in drug development? Well, Chitra, first let me thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to take part in the podcast today and the ongoing work that the, the TMA does on behalf of its patient population. You ask a, a very good question in terms of the role of patient communities in drug development, specifically in the area of rare diseases. And there's a couple things to, to keep in mind. It really wasn't until the last decade uh, that there was, um, a groundswell of interest from pharmaceutical companies in terms of getting into rare disease areas. Obviously, uh, from an economics perspective, when selling a product, having as many consumers as possible makes economic sense, so the more common diseases got the lion's share of attention. Uh, several things have changed over the last couple decades to refocus attention from pharmaceutical companies into the rare disease community, and there are ways uh, to accentuate this and to bring more of that attention to TM, NMO, ADEM, and, and related disorders. And specifically, pharmaceutical companies are looking for a couple different opportunities. So one opportunity is to meet uh, an unmet need. So if there is a um, clear uh, indication that there is an open space, an open market where there aren't other people um, uh, focusing that is very attractive and and for our patient population we definitely have a lot of unmet needs uh, furthermore the drawing of relationships between our patients and the conditions they they suffer from 
and broader populations is an area of intense interest. When pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies are looking to advance a project, uh, they're looking to, to meet needs, but also to determine if a single agent could be useful for multiple different patient populations. So for our patients who suffer from uh, autoimmune conditions, there is an opportunity to, in a way, sell ourselves as a stepping ground, if you will, a stepping stone to other autoimmune diseases. But also we uh, have patients who have had damage uh, to their central nervous system. And so patient communities, whether it be individuals with stroke or spinal cord injury or multiple sclerosis, all have versions of central nervous system damage, and I think it's important for us as a community uh, to show that agents that work for our patients may have value for others. And so you ask, how can individuals uh, play a valuable role? Well, it's actually uh, hard for an individual to steer the attention of a pharmaceutical company. And so we look for individuals to do two things. One is to organize. So an individual trying to get the attention of a, of a company is, is pretty difficult. But many individuals under the organization of associations like the TMA have a very strong possibility of gaining attention from pharmaceutical companies to make significant investments. And then the second way individuals can truly contribute is by taking part in research. There are a lot of studies going on around the nation uh, that are seeking patients with rare disorders, and they recognize that it's a sacrifice to take part in research. But showing that there are a community of patients willing to step up and take part in these uh, fundamental studies, it goes a long way in convincing companies to make uh, tens or even hundreds of million dollars worth of investment in research for our community. That's great. That's very informative. Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Kerr, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, I would sort of ask you the same question. As you have transitioned from academia to pharma, you, you started the first center on TM in 1999 at Johns Hopkins. And, and, you know, would you be able to share how you see pharmaceutical companies can help improve the quality of life of individuals, you know, living with rare neuroimmune diseases? Are there success examples that you can share? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I mean, you know, the way I think the pharmaceutical industry can can look at this is that going into a rare disease like a neuroimmunologic disorder is certainly a worthwhile exercise in and of itself. And as Ben says, it's also kind of a, a toehold into a broader um, disease that may then follow. But if you look at it just as an independent entity, rare diseases have a lot of advantages uh, in terms of drug development, right? So um, often um, in, a, in a drug development uh, program for a rare disease, you may end up only needing to study 50 to 100 patients in total to get approval of that drug for that indication, whereas, for example, in, say, heart failure, you might need to study 6,000 patients in order to get approval. Um, mm -hmm. You also have the uh, Orphan Drug Act, not only in the U.S., but worldwide, which breaks down barriers to studying rare diseases, and it has been an, a, a huge success in the number of companies going into orphan disorders because in some cases there are financial breaks. In some cases it is greater access to regulators like the FDA so that you could get input on what you would need to get the drug approved, whereas you don't have that access if you're studying a common disorder. In some cases you only need one pivotal or phase three study as opposed to a more common disorder when you always will need two controlled phase three studies. So there are a lot of incentives that are put in place to study orphan disorders. And, and Biogen and many other companies like Genzyme and Amgen and others have really moved into that space and have um, a, a series of successes. Um, 
uh, Gaucher's disease is one, right, where it's an incredibly rare lysosomal storage disease. And there are m multiple approved therapies. The clinical development was, uh, I don't know, 45, 50 patients total. Um, and it has been very profitable to the companies that have made enzyme replacements for this. So uh, on the downside, though, this is what we should talk about, right? So on the downside is, one, if it's really rare, companies may say, you know what, I can't find those patients in order to complete those trials. And two, I'm not sure what the natural history is. I'm not sure what really happens to those patients because you don't have uh, all of the data about what what they have experienced. Now, the TMA has been, has been spectacular in starting to get efforts to mitigate those concerns. And, and Ben, you've done a, a really good job. And I think, I think what Ben and others are doing is really developing the necessary data to convince drug companies that transverse myelitis and ADEM and NMO um, um, should be the diseases that these drug companies test, right? Because we do know or we're starting to know the natural history. And, you know, look at, look at what the TMA has accumulated in terms of longitudinal data, and registry information about patients. All of that is incredibly valuable. And one of the things that means is the, the there's an obligation, yeah, maybe that's not the right word, but on the patient to really participate to as, as, as much a degree as they can, even though their lives are incredibly complicated, because the more data that they can input into a system, to help people understand what happens, what transverse myelitis and ADEM and NMO and optic neuritis patients are, are going through and what, what functional deficits they have, the more um, intriguing it will be for companies to develop drugs in that space. That's great. Uh, thank you. But this sort of brings me to another question, and I, maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Greenberg. You know, what What do you think are some of the challenges our diseases particularly face? I mean, you often hear, and some of the examples that you gave, Dr. Kerr, I mean, they you've identified a certain enzyme or a certain gene, but in our group of diseases, it's not, it almost seems like it's not one disease, but several subtypes of the same disease, which certainly makes it harder to, you know, to take the next step towards therapeutics. Um, I'm sure people in our community would love to hear it because since 1999 we've been working on these diseases, and you know, I'd love to see sort of what are the challenges and what can we do to to take things to the next step. Yeah, I, you know, I think the challenges are you, you're right, Chitra, when you talk about that there are certain obstacles when it comes to rare diseases. Heterogeneity is is one of them, having slight differences between different patients who have been diagnosed with the same condition, but also. Um, you know, I actually think one of the the major challenges, if we focus on our community and and not rare diseases in general, is there's very limited uh, data to guide pharmaceutical companies in terms of where the needs are, the prevalence, the incidence, meaning of you know the thousands of people diagnosed with transverse myelitis. What are the current um, uh, levels of functioning amongst all of our uh, patients, uh, what are the different um, needs that they have, how many people uh, need help in terms of our bladder control, how many people are suffering from chronic pain. And that data is, is the starting point of every conversation with pharmaceutical companies. Um, it is how big is your population, what are the needs, and how well characterized are they? Because the, the first thing a company does, and they have an agent. So let's say they had an intervention that could repair the motor system of a spinal cord. There are lots of people in the world with different diseases other than transverse myelitis or NMO or ADEM who need repair to their spinal cord. And so a company says, all right, we have this technology, we have this treatment, we have this intervention, where should we study it first? And the people who have a big say in where to study it first are actually the statisticians um, who look at the available data of populations so that they can tell companies how 
easily would would it be uh, how easy would it be to design and execute a clinical trial? And in order to do that, in order to make those predictions, they have to understand the populations that are affected. One of the biggest and best things the Transverse Myelitis Association did in the last several years to uh, start filling this gap is the launch of the TRAITWISE online survey. Uh, so it used to be that uh, when people filled out their uh, membership form, it went into to Sandy Siegel's kitchen and a, a uh, spreadsheet was created uh, with bits and pieces of data. And as things got updated over the last several years and it went to an online system with uh, surveys and questionnaires being filled out, all of a sudden there was a professional level of data that could be supplied to pharmaceutical companies to say, this is how big a population is, this is their investment and their interest, and here are their needs, here are the issues that they're having. And that has done more, frankly, to garner attention than anything else. And the corollary to that in terms of breaking down the obstacles is back to one of the messages I made earlier. Um, nobody is going to hand treatments to the uh, neurologic rare disease community on a silver platter. Um, th these are not single enzyme diseases or single gene diseases where a scientist in a lab can easily make a connection between their discovery and a patient need. These are conditions that have uh, very uh, diverse and complicated biology, and so we need to attract the attention and uh, this is only going to happen by people um, participating in different research projects that allow us to collect their data in meaningful ways, uh, tabulate that data, and make it available uh, to the world, uh, both academic uh, scientists, clinicians, and biotech companies to say, here is the, the population we serve and here's how well they're characterized. And so everybody gets surveys in their inbox on a regular basis, whether it be from Amazon or Netflix or the TMA. We, we all get inundated with these surveys. If, if you're sitting at home and you're saying to yourself, I, I want more attention being spent on my, on my condition or my loved one's condition, then you, you need to go out and be an army uh, getting everybody to fill out these surveys. Uh, it, it is not a customer service survey. This is not about us. Uh, the TMA getting getting a, a five diamond award. This, this is about us being able to represent our constituency and attract the attention that's needed relative to research investment. Okay, thank you for for bringing that up, Dr. Greenberg. So for people who are listening, you know, it's uh, if, and if you've not already sort of signed up and shared your data through Tradewise, it would be great if you could go to our website, myalitis.org and go to become a member and take the survey so you can share information about your disease, the path that you've taken, how, how, uh, what treatments have worked, what have not worked, so we're able to learn from your story and able to help others as well. Um, Dr. You know, uh, Dr. Kerr, did you want to add anything to what uh, Dr. Greenberg said? Well, I just love listening to Dr. Greenberg. You know that. but And, he, and he's right on all counts. And, you know, one of the other things that is – really important, I think, is that as a company starts to invest in a rare disease space, that there is some way to assess early on in the development program whether the therapy is having a benefit, rather than waiting for years and years and years. And so what Ben and others have been doing is really trying to develop what are called biomarkers, right? So there are ways of assessing whether or not you are affecting uh, the transverse myelitis, right? So you can ultimately hope for an endpoint which is bowel and bladder control and better able to ambulate and lower pain and, and, and better sensation. But there may be some biomarkers which may be kind of electrical tests or imaging tests or even spinal fluid tests which can say that even after 5 or 10 or 15 patients, that the drug has gotten to the spinal cord, for example, and is really starting to um, induce remyelination, for example, that type of thing. And so the, the Transverse Myelitis Association has, be, has been funding these types of things, and they're very important. And so, you know, for patients to participate in, in these studies, I think, is also a very important thing so that we can understand what biomarkers can be built into clinical programs that would predict ultimately a, a clinical endpoint. 
great. Thank you. So this yeah. is bring me to the can I make a comment on that? Sure. Um, you know, so, so, you know, Doug's uh, right on all accounts, and, and I'll bring up one example, though, because the, the question started relative to obstacles, and, and I think it's, uh, as, as Dr. Kerr was talking about biomarkers, you know, one of the, the struggles we have is between uh, balancing um, our primary uh, role uh, as clinician scientists in the setting of caring for patients, and that's the clinician side. We, we are here to take care of patients first and, and research is second. But one of the places where we've seen this um, uh, come up as uh, a struggle is around uh, patients and families who are dealing with uh, the early days of one of these conditions, when when their loved one is first in the hospital suffering from ADEM or transverse myelitis or a, a first attack of neuromyelitis optica. And for anyone on the call who's been through that, who's uh, sat in the hospital bed or sat in the chair next to a hospital bed, uh, you understand and know intimately how scary uh, that situation is. And what we've... Uh, struggled with is, frankly, how do we invite uh, patients and families in those first hours, those first days of struggling with a new diagnosis of rare disease and all the uncertainty that comes with it, how do we connect uh, with individuals to in reinforce to them that they have an opportunity by letting us share data or specimens, uh, a variety of things, to really advance the field in, in tremendously meaningful ways. And we, we've got members of the, the Transverse Myelitis Association who, who uh, speak to families in this situation, and the feedback we've gotten is that it's, it's very difficult. A lot of patients and families aren't ready to have that conversation. But unfortunately, this is where the reality of science hits the reality of clinical care, and that is those early days are, are very important. And so one of the things I'd ask the community, um, I'd ask people on this, listening to this podcast uh, now or in the future, is coming up with ideas or ways where we can, in a supportive way, reach out to families and patients who are undergoing such a, a scary event and, and reinforce that the, the person's care always comes first, but at the same time connect with them in meaningful ways to promote uh, taking part in research during that period of time because we can't go back and recreate it. I, I can't go back and get a blood sample from a patient in the first 24 hours um, to try and develop uh, or identify the biomarkers. And so time uh, is often of the essence, and uh, we struggle with ways to make those connections. So I'd, I'd welcome input um, in the future on, online and in other ways about how do we connect with people in that situation. Great, thank you. Um, and talking about biomarkers, you know, um, there there are at least two clinical trials that I know that are currently available for patients who've been diagnosed with NMO to participate in. Um, both, I believe, are placebo-controlled studies. Would would either of you be willing to sort of share what you think has been the journey it has taken from being able to identify a biomarker to now having clinical trials out in the market to bring new drugs? Um, to market? You go ahead first, Ben. Well, in the setting of um, neuromyelitis optica, where you're right, Chitra, there are multiple trials uh, that have launched and more that are launching. Um, you know, I think that we cannot uh, overestimate the importance of the uh, biomarker that was identified in, in 2004 at the Mayo Clinic, the anti aquaporin 4 antibody. What, um, what happened over the last 10 years relative to NMO is a story we'd like to create in a lot of different conditions. And basically, we, we had a clinical syndrome. We, we recognized that certain patients were suffering from this condition based on the events they had and the symptoms they had. But there was lots of controversy in terms of, well, maybe it's a variant of multiple sclerosis, what is really the underlying immunologic issue, all sorts of questions. And with the identify, identification of the antibody in, in neuromyelitis optica patients and, and the tremendous amount of work that went into validating that biomarker and the importance of it, all of a sudden, we over the last five years, we've been able to study patient populations um, in a very different way, and both in terms of diagnostics, prognostics, and therapeutics. 
And we created a uh, population of patients that are more alike now, that are more uh, homogeneous. And that's a very attractive uh, area of research for pharmaceutical companies because they have a sense of what the mechanism is. They can sit back and look at the drugs they have available and make an educated guess on will their drug work or not versus just throwing darts at a board. And uh, by creating a population, a, a recognition of a population of patients with similarities, they were able to do the statistics to power their studies in ways that is much difficult to do when you don't have a cleanly defined patient population. And so everything that we're seeing uh, in NMO, I think, flows directly from the identification and validation of a biomarker that had implications for understanding the biology and, and changing the diagnostics of the condition. And we'd love to see that in, in other disorders. I think an example um, to put out there is uh, another disorder that the TMA has more recently been advocating for, uh, patients with autoimmune encephalitis, also called limbic encephalitis. And one group of them who have um, an antibody-mediated disease anti-NMDA receptor antibody-mediated encephalitis. And with the identification of that antibody uh, approximately five to seven years ago, the same revolution is happening. We're identifying patients with very specific phenotypes who were being lost over the years, and now we're in conversations with different groups about clinical trials for that disease. And I, I think it reinforces, again, the fact that um, in a world where companies have to hedge their bets, where there, there are a lot of places they can invest the resources, having biomarkers and an understanding of the biology of a condition goes a long way in making them feel comfortable making big investments. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think the worry that you have if you go into a clinical trial without a biomarker is that you're really studying quite distinct disease subtypes, that, you know, one patient is quite different from another, and so whatever your treatment is, it might affect only a subset within that population. And if you have a biomarker that really says, okay, these are very similar patients, it seems to be that, that their disease is more similar than different, then you have greater confidence that a targeted therapy against that um, will be effective and can be demonstrated in that clinical trial. Um, Having said that, that may be difficult in transverse myelitis. Um, here you have, um, you know, largely a, a monophasic disease, certainly not always. And it may be hard to kind of identify a single biomarker that can define a, a subset of transverse myelitis. It's certainly worth trying. But I would also emphasize that even after the acute injury, there are biomarkers that can define exactly what that lesion is and what it has done in the spinal cord. And that, too, would give um, companies and academic consortia comfort that they are studying the right patient population. And it may be that those biomarkers define the extent of demyelination. It may be that they define the extent of, of neuronal injury and can take a, a subset of patients that fit within a, a perfect range to test that therapy. So it's important not only in the acute phase, but uh, also during the, the, the chronic phase to define the optimal patient population for a clinical trial. That's an excellent point, Dr. Kerr. Um, this question actually came from one of our members in our community. They asked, what effort do pharmaceutical companies put into getting the FDA to relax the approval process for drugs that are already out on the market and proven safe, but not approved for use in rare diseases? Well, so, so if, if we have a drug that is approved for a specific indication and we think that it would work in transverse myelitis, um, we very much are going to leverage that initial approval um, to shorten the time frame for it to be developed in another disorder, right? So we would very much like um, if, if we have a drug that's approved in multiple sclerosis and we think that it could work in another disorder, we very much want to study it in that other disorder, but to get it to approval in 
in that second condition as quickly as possible. And the FDA and other regulatory agencies uh, really understand that, and um, to a large degree, they are completely in line with the patient population and the drug company in trying to get that available as quickly as possible so that, for example, the safety data on that drug may be applicable across all of the populations, and you don't have to kind of recreate all of the safety data because you've already got it. Having said that, you you do have to show that there is effectiveness or efficacy in the the second population. So you do have to do studies, and sometimes they have to be placebo controlled. And can, and I, can, I, can, can, I, can I make one comment on that? Please. I I think inherent in um, part of that question uh, is also. Some, sometimes I, I think misunderstandings of the role of the, the FDA, and, and I have to give credit um, to them. They, they have an incredibly difficult job, uh, and I think overall, while, while no group does everything perfect all the time, uh, uh, I think they actually uh, do a very good job of balancing their, their different obligations. And at the heart of their existence is the obligation to ensure that a um, marketed medical product is both relatively safe and efficacious for the disorder that they are marketed for. It's, uh, it's a simple statement, but embedded in that is obviously a lot of complexities. And uh, the FDA isn't a you know, just bureaucratic organization. It's people. It's scientists. It's clinicians who sit and weigh the evidence. And as, as Dr. Kerr said, um, as drugs that are uh, already on the, the market for one condition uh, are brought forward, I think the FDA takes the safety data into account, and I think there are faster pathways uh, to approval for a new indication. It's not always the FDA's unwillingness, but sometimes companies don't want to jump through the hoops for the extra indications, and so that becomes a very different issue. I think case in point, one of the best examples in our rare disease community is the use of rituximab for neuromyelitis optica which is not FDA-approved for NMO. It's used in an off-label fashion, but it's an FDA-approved drug for other conditions, including autoimmune diseases. I think the FDA would be thrilled to consider approving rituximab for NMO, but somebody has to submit the application. The company has to. And often uh, companies do the math because there's expense and work that goes into that. You have to do a clinical trial to prove the efficacy. And sometimes they do the math and decide that that's uh, not uh, economically feasible for one reason or another. And so we get caught sometimes as a, a patient advocacy organization in, in the middle of this, but I, I'm uh, not sure. In fact, I, I'd be willing to bet most of the time the, the obstacles are not from the FDA level. The other thing to be aware of when it comes to the FDA for rare diseases is the rules are softened, I should say. Uh, the path to approval is significantly easier for a rare disease than it is for a non-rare disease. The amount uh, of trials you need is, are, uh, is less. The size of those trials is smaller. There is more negotiation on outcomes and on timelines. And so I think there is a willingness to need an enthusiasm uh, from the FDA for trying to uh, figure out the best way to determine, again, what their goal is. Is the intervention relatively safe and efficacious for the disorder that it's it's reportedly going to treat? Um, that, that is very enlightening. So, it's, so do you think that there is a role for communities like ours to be able to influence companies that may have a drug that, you know, is used off-label but can now be put through the process to become an, uh, a marketed indicated drug? Yeah, I, I, I do, and, and I, I'd be curious to have Doug comment on this as well. Um, it, my view is uh, companies are motivated um, in three ways, and, and probably many more than this. I honestly believe that there are a lot and I would hope the majority of companies that really believe in their mission to improve the, the health and well-being of, of their neighbors, friends, and loved ones, that, that this isn't always just about money. Um, and, I, I don't, and I think that's the case. I, I, I work with people at companies from around the world, and there is genuine interest in, in doing the right thing. That said, the second motivating factor is based on 
they are companies. They have a fiduciary responsibility to their stockholders uh, to make decisions that are going to be profitable. Um, and if they aren't, then they go away and none of us have any medications. And so there is an economic argument that has to be made for each trial and indication of a drug. But the third uh, responsibility is about pipeline. This is about making sure in research and development that as they're doing perhaps smaller trials in rare diseases, that it may be able to be leveraged in other ways. So in terms of those three missions that I've perceived as an outsider coming from biotechnology, I think the TMA and uh, its, its members can play a big role. One is that the membership has to thrive and has to be vocal. So in any organization, it's usually about 3% of the organization that does 98% of the work. When you, when you look at successful groups uh, around the world to really drive uh, biotech, it's, it's when that number of people who are truly getting involved uh, increases, and, and that involvement speaks volumes to companies in terms of meeting their needs for serving a community uh, instead of just talking to the leadership, really seeing that there is an engaged population makes a difference. And the second, and I know I've made this point before, but it is important, is um, somebody has to take part in trials. Uh, there, there are individuals who uh, make decisions with their care providers that despite certain risks, they are willing to step over that threshold into the world of clinical research. And one of the decision points that companies have when considering a trial is from the time they start the trial, how long will it take them to enroll? So let's say they need 30 patients in order for the, the trial to determine safety and efficacy. If they can enroll those 30 patients in six months versus two years, they will bet on the six-month enrollment any day of the week and twice on Sunday. It's that time to enrollment that can kill projects. And so having a community of patients who step up, raise their hand, and say, I am willing to take part with input from their clinicians, with advice from their care providers in terms of reasonability for their condition, but having them raise their hands and say, I, I would take part, goes a long way in getting companies to gamble, to, to roll the dice and spend the money on rare disorders. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, and I think, you know, the things that the TMA um, has been doing in, in not only participating in clinical trials, but gathering data, longitudinal data, um, a, a well-formed registry that is informative, understanding the natural history, um, and, and developing biomarkers are the things that are, are really compelling. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. So there's the parent project muscular dystrophy. Uh, which is an advocacy group for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, has done that as uh, as has the TMA. They also have gone to the FDA and worked out a what's called a white paper on how to develop drugs in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And the FDA has essentially signed off on this as the roadmap for how you would do this. And it gets into the clinical trial design, the outcomes, the statistics, and the biomarkers. And that was done very much with the advocacy group itself, patients, and the FDA, along with companies involved. And, and you know, this is what the, the TMA is doing, and the more uh, involved that we can get, I, I think the better we'll be. Okay, thank you. That's great to hear that there are you know, there's precedents and that there are success stories. Um, you know, changing gears a bit, we've received a couple of questions about uh, placebo-controlled trials, and I know we had a separate podcast talking about this, but you know, this would be a good time to sort of refresh um, that knowledge as well. The question is, if a treatment is working, what is the incentive to participate in a clinical trial with a chance that the new treatment will not work or one might get placebo, which could result in a new attack? Uh, you know, I'm more than willing to be in a trial of treatment that's designed to fix the damage done. Uh, well, Dr. Einberg, would you like to take it first or Dr. Kirk? I'll, tell you, I'll try first. Um, you know, I think that the the obligation that we have is to expose 
as few patients to placebo as we possibly can. Nobody wants to have a patient enroll and get placebo. And, and so you try to minimize the patients who get it and minimize the time that any placebo patients would be on placebo and then provide them with drug at the completion of that time. That's kind of the overarching principle. Um, and so that patients who would come into a placebo controlled trial should be offered active drug at the completion of that trial. Now, ultimately, you'd like to be able to get rid of placebo entirely, but you may not be able to because the other overarching principle is that you've got to do the study that convinces regulators to approve the drug. And if you design a study that doesn't have placebo, regulators many times have come back and said, sorry, no go. You have not demonstrated the effectiveness of your drug. We will not approve it, and therefore it's not available to anybody. And so, you know, it, it is important that um, people who come into a, a clinical trial recognize that this is not therapy. It is clinical research. It is testing an unknown, and in some cases, when you don't know how patients would have behaved, you have to have a control group. And so, you know, we always look to eliminate or reduce the placebo, but we have a deep obligation to the community at large that we have to do this study that doesn't waste the time of patients and um, that we do the study that gives the greatest likelihood that the drug would be approved. And so we struggle with that every time we design a trial. Ben, what's your reaction to that? Well, I, I almost totally agree. Um, I, I would change the language a, a little bit. Um, the, so I think there is a tendency for us in, in clinical research, uh, whether we be at academic centers, patient advocacy organizations, or in biotech, to talk about these trials relative to approval, and it's over the. And I, I'm, I, I used to do the exact same thing, and sometimes catch myself still using that language, but I've tried to migrate over the last year to, um, to, not focus on approval, um, but focus on why does something get approved? It gets approved because it's been shown to be relatively safe and efficacious for a condition. And so what's interesting is when, when we use the language that we're doing trials to try and gain approval, we come to the conversation with the mindset that we are trying to appease bureaucrats, that, there, that there's a group on high stamping approved, not approved, when in reality the group we should be trying to appease is ourselves, that the interventions we are doing make a difference in our patients' lives um, in a meaningful way. And there are several examples in history where, frankly, we were, we were wrong. Um, when I was uh, going through medical school, uh, when somebody would come in with a stroke, we were taught to put them on blood thinners right away and make sure they don't have another clot. Well, it wasn't until people did very large trials that they found out, yes, I was helping some patients, but I was killing as many patients as I helped. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. That the dogma of treatment turned out not to be so uh, convincing. We've done this in Lou Gehrig's disease and other conditions where we were convinced that therapies were making a difference. And we were following our hearts and our minds, and there was reasons to believe it and anecdotal evidence to believe it and, and uh, small-scale uh, experiences to believe it. And when we did the controlled study, we found out we were doing more harm than good. And so in the rare disease community, we treat our patients based on the best available evidence at the time I'm sitting in the room seeing the patient. As a community, however, yes, sorry. As a community, however, we have an obligation when the opportunities arise to collect a level of evidence to determine are we doing the right thing by our patients. While I may be suppressing attacks with uh, Celsept and rituximab for my NMO patients, how many patients nationwide are having life-threatening infections or complications from immunosuppression? We only get that data through clinical trials. 
And so if you're a patient or a family member with one of these conditions and you're trying to decide, do I take part, it's an incredibly personal decision. But, but Doug's comment is right. It is recognizing you are taking part in research and not clinical care. It is, it is not, by definition, standard of care. You are stepping up to be one of the pioneers to hopefully help yourself and generations to come. And while we all fear going on placebo, sometimes the placebo arm does better than the treated arm, and people on placebo were happy to be there. And so we, we have to accept the research experience for what it is. It is... Uh, discovery, but trying as best as we can to balance safety, where people are observed in very intense fashion so that the first sign of trouble with multiple levels of review, both at an individual and a population basis, we do not subject our patients to undue risk or harm. And that is a, it's a very delicate balancing act, but in all research, we put the safety of our, our patients first, recognizing the unknowns that go into both our clinical care and the research endeavors we pursue. Great. Dr. Kerr, do you have anything to add? No, I think he said it beautifully. Great. Um, so, you know, this has been incredibly informative, sort of learning what the role of pharmaceutical companies can be, what we as a community can do. Um, and as we are sort of getting to the 50, 55 minute mark of this podcast, um, I would love to sort of hear from you, Dr. Greenberg, in, in, in a few minutes, what are some of the currently available clinical studies um, in the field of rare neuroimmune diseases that people can participate in? And, you know, people often ask, how do I find out what drugs are now in development? Like, how do they keep track of what's coming down the pipeline? Is that even possible? Yes, it's a great question, and um, I'm actually going to start with the second question first in terms of how do you keep track. So if you're sitting at home and you want to know um, what studies are out there for my condition, um, two things, and I'm going to list them in order of what you should do. So number one is uh, ensure you are a member of the, the Transverse Myelitis Association. They do an incredible job of keeping their membership informed via emails or updates on what research is going on out there. And so they're, they're, they're doing the work for you. They're filtering uh, the noise of the world to try and provide you with meaningful information. The second thing you can do is go to uh, a website, www.clinicaltrials.gov. Um, this is a website that is a service of the U.S. Uh, National Institutes of Health. Uh, we are required uh, to list all clinical research that goes on in our centers at this website. It's to create a clearinghouse specifically for patients. It is user-friendly. When you go to that website, clinicaltrials.gov, there's a search box that says search for studies, and you can just type in your condition. So if you were to type in transverse myelitis, it would list all of the currently recruiting uh, as well as studies that have finished recruiting. So uh, sitting here today, I typed it in, and there were 17 open studies for transverse myelitis uh, going on in um, uh, the U.S., or at least listed by the, the NIH. And these include studies for both transverse myelitis and then uh, conditions where that term comes up. So, for example, studies on neuromyelitis optica. And so there are a variety of different research opportunities out there. If you look at the currently recruiting um, studies for transverse myelitis, there are multiple that are looking at biomarkers and clinical data. There are some that are looking at symptomatic treatment. Uh, uh, Dr. Michael Levy at um, Johns Hopkins is doing a study of dalfampridine uh, in patients with transverse myelitis to try and improve walking. There are multiple trials uh, for agents for neuromyelitis optica to prevent relapses. The Mayo Clinic is looking at a trial of plasma exchange. Multiple sites are taking part in a study of a drug called eculizumab. There is a drug um, uh, known as SA237, which is um, a uh, pharmaceutical-sponsored uh, trial um, uh, from a company named Chugai Pharmaceutical. There is a study looking at a uh, drug to impact B cells called 9551, and these are all listed there. 
but then there are also uh, studies looking at um, a variety of uh, uh, treatments, including mesenchymal stem cell therapies, uh, to try and treat the long-standing uh, disabilities of these conditions. So, so the clinicaltrials.gov is um, a great way uh, to do a search based on condition. And when you click on a study, it will tell you where it's occurring, what the inclusion criteria are, what they're measuring, um, and give you some detailed descriptions, as well as contact information for the sites near you that may be recruiting for that study. Um, you will see that there's a lot going on, um, and each study may not be appropriate for every patient, but it's a great way to, to search through and, and see what's appropriate for you. I will say you can go even further and do, if you spend time on the website, you can do advanced searches where you can easily even screen by criteria. So if, if you're a woman who's 25 years old, uh, interested in a phase three study, you can put all that information about yourself on this website and it will only pull up the studies that would apply to you. So it's a very valuable tool for keeping track of um, what's an option for you uh, relative to clinical research. Just one other point on that. Uh, so that is if the clinical study is within the United States, but if it is not, uh, companies do not have to list that on clinicaltrials.gov. So in the, in the EU, that same thing is clinicaltrialsregister.eu. Same thing that Ben was just talking about. I'm not aware of one in Asia uh, for that, but but um, you'd have to look probably at the transverse myelitis to keep us appraised on that. But those two sites will get you um, most of the clinical trials that are happening. That's great, fantastic. Um, so, so in closing, I sort of love to hear from both of you. Um, you know, your, your any final thoughts that you want to add on the on the topic um, of the podcast today. That you know, any message you'd like to share with our community. Can we start with you, Dr. Kerr? Well, you know, I think um, if if I can just go back to the very beginning, at least for. Chitra and Ben and I, you know, back in 1999, we knew so little about transverse myelitis and these other conditions. And um, we didn't know how to classify them. Uh, we didn't know how to treat them. We didn't know how to really diagnose them. And we've come a long way. And, um, you know, it is a real tribute to the Transverse Myelitis Association and to the, the patients and their families and this deep commitment to advancing our understanding of you know, uh, a very complex set of diseases. And um, I think we've now set the stage for better years ahead. I think that there is interest in developing therapies and the technology has advanced to the point where I think we can repair uh, the damage that has been done and we can institute smart um, immunomodulatory therapies or therapies that shift the immune system such that uh, the damage is less. And um, you know, Ben is Ben is our fearless leader here and, and really uh, has done a great job of advancing this field forward. And um, I think it's really important for the, the TMA to continue its efforts and for patients and their families to continue to, to input information. Uh, I think we'll see some advances uh, in the future. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. Well, uh, Doug's being too kind in terms of referring to me as a fearless leader. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm fearless or, or leading this. Um, I, I am part of a tremendous um, group. I've been absolutely blessed to, to be part of this community and to be welcomed into this community and, and to work with people like Doug and, and Chitra and Roberta and everyone at the PMA. Um, and, I, and I'm not fearless. Um, I, I, I definitely do do have fears in terms of our ability to um, capitalize on opportunities as they arise. And I, I think in rare diseases more than anywhere else, um, what we've learned is the trickle down of therapeutics um, is not going to occur based on the uh, benevolence or insights of people in scientific labs or or at companies. It, it's going to be a pull down. It's it's going to be the grassroots 
organizing and creating a very loud, very vocal, very unified voice um, that attracts the attention of others. And it's, it's through either uh, intriguing people scientifically or, more importantly, telling the personal stories. I mean, if we look at the ice bucket challenge online that raised $113 million for ALS, I mean, just, just a, an incredibly remarkable feat in a short period of time, nothing like it ever ever had occurred before. What drove so many people, uh, besides the, the uh, fun factor and, and the, the um, uh, uh, excitement around what was going on, was the personal stories, um, engaging a community, engaging a family, engaging a neighborhood, engaging a, a church or synagogue or mosque, so that your your neighbors, your peers, your colleagues know what you're going through because they, they human beings care about each other and they're willing to step up when they are aware and when asked. And it's up to the community to uh, create that voice and tell their personal stories and get people involved um, to really get the spotlight and then ultimately the resources to, to make real dents in these conditions. Uh, thank you both um, incredibly for your for your wisdom, your knowledge, for sharing it with us, for committing your careers to study these diseases, and for looking after people in our community. Um, this has been an incredibly great podcast. Um, truly appreciative to both of you. Um, and this will be recorded and made available on our website, and it can also be downloaded on iTunes. Uh, thank you both. Bye-bye.